Today I'm going to talk about tithing. And in my early life, I admit to you that would be a subject that I would have avoided at all cost. I actually didn't begin to tithe until I was almost 30. Up till then, I was playing baseball with a catcher's mitt in both hands, trying to get all that I could get without giving back anything. And what you learn in the magic of tithing is that without tithing, you can only achieve a certain success. And there is a difference between outer happiness and inner happiness. Inner happiness is that soul happiness that comes out from you instead of trying to get happiness to come into you from outside events where you're just naturally in a state of well-being, in a state of expectation because you know you've done what you need to do and that God will bring you incredible blessings. So let's talk about tithing. The first thing that I want to stress is in life, if you really want to be successful, if you want to make a difference, you have to get involved with something bigger than yourself. You have to be a part of something that will make a difference in the world. And most people think in the beginning, well, what could I do? What difference could I make? It's an incredible difference. If you're willing to, to go the extra mile, I tell a story on one of our other television channels about John D. Rockefeller, and I'd like to share that story with you because it has become so popular. John D. Rockefeller was a strong and a husky man. He was a man's man. He was a man that other people looked up to. And in truth, other people looked up to to hate. He was a strong man, and he would not ever stop himself from walking over other people, hurting other people. He earned a lot of money because he drove himself. He was thinking all the time, well, he said to himself, when I make a million dollars, then I'll be able to relax. And then after I make a million dollars, then I will be happy. But he got a million dollars and it didn't do it for him. So he sought to make another million and then another and then another. He never worried ever about what he was doing to other people, only that drive. He was so driven that through his busyness, he was constantly hurting other people. He had only one thought in his mind, and that was making money. And the reason he had that thought is he thought perhaps then he could relax. Then he would find that elusive well-being and happiness. At the age of 54, he was dying. He had a disease that caused him to lose all the hair on top of his head. And that was not only on top of his head being bald, but all the hair on his body. He didn't have any eyebrows. He sort of looked like a mummy. His family said, poor John, he only has about a year to live. Well, he was in the hospital room. And he overheard his family say this. And there was a mirror in the hospital room, and he laid there, and he was talking to himself. And he said, well, he said, here you are. Here you are. You have everything that you ever wanted in life. You have all the money. And now you're going to die. And then he came to himself and his soul, and he started to have a real 
conversation with himself, something that we all need to do, and hopefully it will happen before we're dying. He said, John, as he looked in the mirror, he said, are you happy? And he had to admit to himself, as we all have to admit at some point, no, this isn't working. Everything that I've tried to do up till now, it's just not working. I'm not happy. And as a matter of fact, everyone hates me. And they did hate him. He had three guards outside his hospital room door so that people wouldn't come in and try to hurt him. And as he's looking in the mirror, he said, what kind of life is this? Let me give you a biblet. A biblet is a small mini Bible in terp. R the word repent in the Bible, it means to turn around from the way you're going, turn around and raise up higher. Raise up higher to what? Well, a different way than you've been doing it. Going to God and allowing God's actions of love and giving to come through you and use you. That's repenting. And it's not a one-time event. It's a daily event. Because we slip back into those human ways, those driven ways. And so John, he talked to himself in that hospital room and he said, well, he said, if I'm only going to live for a year, I'm going to start giving to people and start doing things for them. I'm going to start to make a difference with the life that I have left. I'm going to start to, to make amends. And miracles happened. Miracles do happen when you repent. He started to give away his fortune. He formed the Rockefeller Foundation. He gave to the poor. He gave to the needy. He cared more about others than he did about himself. He funded medical research. It is an American Scrooge story. He discovered in what he thought was the end what made him happy. And for the first time since childhood, he started to enjoy his life. He savored every day. He got so much out of life that he got well. Of, of course. If you hold life inside of you, life regenerates itself. He became really healthy, vital, alive, filled with energy, filled with joy. Now listen to this. He lived from when he was supposed to die at age 54 to age 98. He never had another sick day in his life. He discovered what we need to discover many times. He was killing himself by being so self-possessed. He lived from then on by bringing joy to others. And in so doing, he brought it to himself. Now, I admit to you that I first got into spiritual study for self-improvement. But there comes a time in spirituality where you must have mature spirituality. And that is to be more concerned with others' improvement. I have a sign in the Positive Christianity office to to stare at me every day. And here's what it says. It's not me, it's them. It's you. You have to become involved in something bigger than yourself. And you have to find your life in that. And when you do, you realize, as John D. Rockefeller realized, that the best is yet to be. So many that I talk to, especially electronically by prayer request, they believe that the best of their life is behind them. I believe that you can believe 
this strongly if you're too much into self instead of others involved. When you realize that you can live from a much higher vantage point in life than you've ever lived in the past, the best is yet to be. Marcus Bach, the author, tells a true story of one time that he was speaking at a Rotary Club. After he spoke, the town banker came up to him and said, Say, Mr. Bach, since your talk was on religion, did you get to know the man that introduced you this morning? And Marcus said, No, I, I didn't have a chance to talk with him. He seemed like a nice fellow, but I really didn't get a chance to say much more than hello to him. Well, the banker went on, almost without blinking, said, You know, six years ago, he came to my bank to borrow $7,000. He, he wanted to start a trucking business. Well, he had enough security, so I loaned him the money. I sat there at my desk making out the deposit slip for the $7,000 to be put in his personal account, and the man said, uh, just a minute. I would like you to make out a separate slip for 700 and put it into a special account. Well, he said, I looked up puzzled. And then he said, that's the Lord's money. And the banker, literally, telling the story the second time, put his head in his hands and said, oh my, I have agreed to give this loan to a full-fledged crackpot sitting right in front of me. You know, this man put $700 into that special checking account that he used for charity, religious causes, and the like, that he used for tithing? The banker said to Marcus, Do you find many people who really take this thing seriously? Tithing? And he asked the question that I probably would have asked, How is this person doing financially? Marcus wanted to know. Well, the banker shrugged his shoulders and said, that's something I can't understand amazingly well. Amazingly. The banker acknowledged that he had a fleet of nine trucks now and keeps giving away more and more money all the time. The banker continued saying, I've heard of big men and big concerns doing things like this, and I've done a little bit myself in the matter of giving, but this 10% nonsense kind of strikes me as being reckless. Well, Marcus just smiled. Marcus Bach decided the next day to find out for himself, so he dropped in on this reckless tither, this trucking executive, and the trucking executive said to Marcus, why, it's simply just part of my program now. When I started, I didn't have one single Christian principle to which I subscribed without question. Everything I believed was held conditionally, always open to change. Even the golden rule, I was flexible enough to adjust to circumstances. Then the trucking executive admitted. He said, one day... I noticed that everything in my life was at a low ebb. I couldn't go down much further without being out of business, without being destitute. I heard a message about tithing, about 10 percenting on my business, and I decided, well, I'll get down to basics. Either God is real or God is not. And if God is real, then God can be proved. In Deuteronomy 8, verse 18, it says, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, 
for it is thee that giveth power to get wealth. Now let me stop there. You don't get wealth. God gives the power to get wealth. God is your source. It's not your employment check, your social security check. Your source is the source of life itself. God. Now I continue. That they may establish God's covenant, which he swore unto thy fathers as it is this day. Let me tell you another story. In southern Iowa, there is a car dealer. He is regarded as the town's number one citizen. He's generous. He's civic-minded. He has built his life around the belief that giving is the only justification for getting. And it started 17 years ago. Ever since then, he's had a special account in the bank. He says he has a stated time when he closes his year with the Lord and immediately opens it back up again. He says, it's not my money, it's God's. And that is a tithing account. It is a full 10%. The man has always had the resources for giving. And he said, though, even though I had the resources... I didn't have the will. He just didn't think it was necessary. He was led into his present activity because he realized that other persons with less resources than he had had the will. He realized that he was not handling the promises of God in the proper way, accepting them, or even believing totally, completely, that God is real. See, Either you believe God is real, or you don't. And I think the ultimate test is tithing. Even in the Bible, it says, prove me now. <clears throat> the only place that God says, prove me, is in the area of tithing. This Ford dealer in southern Iowa lives in a town of 3,000. Now, in a town of 3,000, you can't expect to sell many cars. And yet he is the top Ford dealer in that area and surrounding states. The Ford Motor Company even wanted to know what in the world is going on. They wanted to know how is he advertising, what is he doing. No special advertising, no special doing. Ah, but special giving. He is a tither. And in a town of 3,000, this type of thing gets noticed pretty quickly by the citizens of the community. A storekeeper heard of this story, and he said to himself, well, he said that's one for him. He has lots of money, but I hardly have any money. And then he kept watching the car dealer and how the car dealer prospered and did well in his community surrounding communities and surrounding states. And he had to admit, as many had to admit, it is simply miraculous. He decided this storekeeper, if it works with dollars, it will work with pennies too. And he was able to start a special program of giving to the Lord with pennies. And this storekeeper turned his life around. And in a few short years, he was able to buy the store that he was clerking in. In Malachi 3, verse 8, Will a man rob God? And yet you rob me, but you ask, How do I rob you? In tithes and offerings. My friend, it is God's will for you to prosper. But in order to prosper under God's will, you have to obey God's laws. There is a formula for prosperity that has been the greatest ever given to humankind, and it is certainly the greatest in this time of opportunity. It is an opportunity beyond economic 
conditions that is given directly from God to each individual, directly to you. And it works regardless of what your economic conditions are around you as a direct heir of God. In your life, there is a road to recovery, but it is not an outer road. It's an inner spiritual road of changing your mind inside of yourself. But how do you permanently change your mind? That is the key. It is agreeing to work under God's laws. Now, tithe. The word tithe comes from the Old English word theagata, which means a tenth part. To tithe means one-tenth of a person's income. In the Bible, to tithe was to support the religious order, which states, When you receive money, I will give you as your inheritance. You must present a tenth of that as a tithe, as the Lord's offering. Your offering will be reckoned to you as grain. And that means that it will be reckoned back to you in such a way that it is countless. You, you cannot count the, the grain that is in a field. And in the same way, you will not be able to count the blessings that come to you in seen and unseen ways from God. Let me give you another example. Benjamin Franklin, he is remembered not only for his statesmanship and his inventions, but also for his tithing. And perhaps in his day, more so for his tithing. George Washington wrote to him as follows in 1789. To be venerated for giving, if to be admired for talents, if to be esteemed for patriotism, if to be beloved for tithing good works, can glorify the human mind, you must have, dear sir, the pleasing consolation to know you have not lived in vain." I believe that God gives us ideas, divine ideas. Perhaps it was God that gave him his ideas for his inventions. Perhaps it was one of the ways of the, of the grain coming back that could not even be counted in his life. And after his death, in his will, Franklin left $5,000 each in trust for 200 years to Boston and Philadelphia. Now, this was an incredible, sizable amount of money at the time. Franklin also established America's first city hospital, the Pennsylvania Hospital for the Unfortunate. Malachi 3.10 Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, so that there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open up the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great that you won't have room enough to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Let me give you another story. Ken Kyes is a famous author now, but he used to be in real estate. And he went to Florida because Florida was having a boom. And when he got there, soon after, the boom went bust. There was a real recession across the entire state. And he did not have one property in foreclosure. He probably had hundreds. And then he prayed, and he said, God, I need your help. 
I'm at a low ebb in my life, and I will start today living under your law. I will start to tithe. Now, I don't have much, and what I have is going to be taken away from me. At least that's what I see with my human eyes, but I will start to tithe. And so he started, probably with pennies, he started to tithe. The first year, his income rose by 60%. The second year, his income jumped by 100% in a recession economy. He became the largest real estate company in Florida at the time. Ken Keyes taught the formula to one of his salesmen. His salesman was getting ready to declare bankruptcy. Within a year, the salesman had paid off all of his debt, and he had a sizable bank account. I have found this in my own life, and I'm always excited about this subject, even though you probably don't want to hear it. I didn't want to hear it. I don't know why I avoided it so much, but I did. And then when you get to that point where you have to look at yourself in the mirror and say, hey, this isn't working, and you begin to work the plan that God gave us, you realize that everything starts to turn around in a miraculous way. Leviticus 27, verse 30. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Well, John D. Rockefeller used this formula, and probably a lot more than 10%. I give away more than 10% now. You find in time you cannot outgive God. Whatever you give, it comes back to you multiplied. J.C. Penney of the J.C. Penney department stores used this formula. William Colgate, a name that you'll recognize, he left home penniless and he learned of the tithing formula. In Proverbs 3, verse 9, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. Heinz pickles. When's the last time you had one of those? They're good. Heinz pickles are known all over the world. What is not known is that Heinz used this tithing formula to build his business success. Craft of craft cheese, and that's good too, is a household word everywhere. Well, Mr. Kraft used the tithing formula in his business career. Jacob promises 10% of all of his property to God. Genesis 28, 22. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. And that is, that's a key. Because everything you have comes from God. The older I get, the more I know this. And if it's all from God anyway, you have to have a circulation. You can't go through life with a catcher's mitt in both hands wanting to just get without throwing anything back. Here's what I recommend. Taking God into partnership with you. I often teach this in my relationship seminar. Never just go in with the two of you into a relationship. Always have the trinity of a perfect relationship, the other person, God, and you. Always bring God into that mix. And I tell this illustration, if I was to take two hairs from the top of your head and weave it into a weave, the minute I let go it would unravel. But if I add a third strand of hair, that weave would last for all eternity. 
And so it is true with you, everything you do. Your business partner, your customers always have God in there. You, God, and your customer. You, God, and your business partner. You, God, and your co-workers. Everyone that you're in relationship with. It consists of agreeing to give this main partner in your life 10% of the proceeds of your business or your career. And 10%. That is not much to give to a partner in business, especially a partner who is all wise and all powerful. Now, you might think that this whole talk is about getting you to tithe to positive Christianity. Some of you will, and I thank you for that. But it is where you receive your spiritual food, like your home church. You know that we never tell you where to go to church. We only tell you to go. Because it is so important for you to be a part of a spiritual family. You know, Christ understood this law. That's why he said, give and it shall be given to you. Christ said that it is more blessed to give than to receive. You have to create a channel inside of you. We're all part of God. The basic unity underlying all, which inseparably unites the good of the individual with the good of the whole of God is creating a channel through you in your free will to allow the good from your source, God, to pass through you onto others. God will give to you. But in your free will, you must give to God first. And then God will give you of the overflow of the 100-fold return. The Bible talks about a tithe, giving to God 10%, but it says what you will get back is a 100-fold return, and perhaps more. You will not be able to contain it all. It is so great. I will open the windows of heaven for you. It says... Now listen to this next part. Most people miss this. Until you say enough. Most people only open the window just a little bit and they say, Oh, God, that's fine. No, that's fine. I, I'm good. That's enough. You have to learn to, in a humble way, receive. As well as in a humble way, give. To have a complete circulation in your life. You have to be a good steward of the money that God gives you, not hoarding, but continually giving back your 10% to keep the channels of flow open. Now let me give you some more proof. This tithing formula was used by Henry P. Crowell, the creator of Quaker Oats. M.W. Baldwin, the railway equipment manufacturer, used tithing to build his success against all odds. A.A. Hyde, the man who made mentholatum a household word, used tithing to turn around the circumstances of his life and make his life a success. Ten percent to God. That is a huge step for a human being that is behind the wall of doubt to step over in faith. I've known many people that were in show business. And in show business, if you had a good agent that would provide you constantly with good ideas and guidance for your life, opportunities you wouldn't think anything of giving 10% to that agent 
for the breaks and the hunches and the new ideas, you would say, as I've heard many people say in show business, it's a privilege to give him or her 10%. Well, you'll think that, but a whole lot more, on a deeper level than just human, on a deep soul, spiritual level, you'll be like the man in the rowboat going after Moby Dick, who has tartar sauce in the rowboat. You're going to know ahead of time that you're going to be a success because God is your partner. You are not alone. And you're working with God. You're giving this partner 10% of the proceeds of your business, your career, through the channel through which you receive your spiritual food. Let us pray. Dear God, I pray once and for all that I put it on the line and I believe in you. I desire in this moment to take my spirituality to a new height, to practice. I pray that I not only receive, but I give of what I receive back so it is multiplied and I'm willing to receive more. I am willing to turn around my life to make a lifetime commitment to a 10% tithe. And all that I get from this moment on, I will give back to you, God, 10%. And you, in turn, will turn around my entire life. I thank you, God, for lifting me above the economic circumstances that I might find myself in in the moment of time. Lift me spiritually. Motivate me spiritually. Help me to go beyond myself and just getting for self and being a part of making a difference in others' lives. In Jesus Christ's name, I so act and react to this message through action. Amen.